All right, all right, guys. Welcome, welcome to the West Bank Real Estate Meetup tonight. Uh, appreciate you all coming out. Um, Emil's, Emil's going to come soon, uh, so I'm going to kick off um, the interviews to start with. So we have uh, an ambitious agenda tonight. Um, we just thought for the end of the year we want to do something different, right? So we're we're bringing back people that have spoken at our at our um, our meetup before, right? So everyone that's up tonight has been here before. We've interviewed them in depth. Uh, if you want the full in-depth interview, definitely go to our YouTube channel and check that out and you'll see their full story. But tonight we want to be really focused, right? It's the end of the year. It's December. 23 is winding down. 24 is ready to start. So we just want to be really focused and learn from people today. Um, want to ask these past speakers, these industry, industry people, what they learned this year and what they're focusing on slash changing next year. So just going to be really focused on those two questions. You know, we're going to try to keep it short and sharp. I'm looking at you, Courtney, um, <laughs> and, and there. But so that that that's 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 the agenda. Uh, I'm very um, happy to to welcome our first guest, um, who's flown in for us tonight, um, Dominique Gunderson. Um, a lot of you probably know her. She's a very active flipper in our market. Uh, she does it remotely. She actually lives in Colorado now. Um, so she and she's doing a lot of volume in our market. So um, thanks for coming, Dominique. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, um, so really, I've really got two questions for you. So I'm going to start with the first question. Um, you know, 23, it's been an interesting year. Um, how have you found it and what have been your main lessons from this year? Yeah, um, 23 has been a very interesting year. <laughs> um, so I would say probably the biggest thing I've learned, um, which just to give background, if anyone doesn't know, I historically have done a lot of fix and flips in the entry level 200K and under uh, price point in Jefferson Parish, single family homes. So pretty much like basic bread and butter houses that most buyers, it's in their price point, easy to sell. Historically, it's been kind of where the market moves. Um, biggest thing I learned this year, honestly, is how to accept losing or losses um, because man, Q3 and Q4 of this year, like that segment of the market specifically, but all segments of the market just change drastically. Um, I, I cannot sell houses right now, like in that price point specifically, um, 200K and under, not that we can't get showings, not that we can't get offers, uh, I just can't sell them. Um, buyers are backing out like last minute, inspection repairs, like, not even asking for stuff, just freaking out when they see the report and backing out, um, get to the day before closing and they'll lose their deposit, but just not close, like just crazy things. Um, and so I don't know, it's, it's, it's been a, a mix of like accepting the loss sometimes financially on a property, but there's a lot of other things that come with that. Um, when the market starts to change, at least for me that I've had to make changes in my businesses this year that feel kind of like a loss, um, whether it be a loss of team members because things are changing, you got to tighten the ship or, um, you know, a loss of time because you're doing things over or you're having to change your systems or processes. Um, so just a lot of like losses that kind of stack up on top of each other where it just feels really weighty. Um, it's not just like, oh man, that was a tough, you know, escrow to get through, but we made it through and on to the next. It's like, man, every day there's like, you know, just different losses of, you know, money, time, relationships, whatever it might be, um, they kind of stack up. So. How do you, how do you, how do you pick yourself up from that? Yeah, it's been tough. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been a hard year. I would say probably for me, it's just like, this is what I love. Yeah. Um, this is what I do. This is what I've always done, like since the day I graduated high school. So for me, like this is my thing and, and it'll always be my thing. And I just recognize that there's going to be hard years, like the good years are going to be really good and build up and save for the years that follow that aren't going to be as good. Um, so I think that's kind of my mindset is just that it comes in seasons and this just happens to be one of the not so good ones, but the really good times are ahead, you yeah. know, like they always are. So just got to stick with it. Do you have, um, so, so I mean, taking losses, sometimes important, sometimes you got to cut your losses and keep moving. Uh, is there lessons within the losses? Like are there, are there things, what are the, sort of maybe leading into, like what are the things you're changing slash doing differently, you know, from, from those losses? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, when you, when you win on deals and everything's good, 
it's cool and it's fun, but you really don't learn anything, right? Mm. There's nothing that you can figure out to do differently next time. So I would say I've, I've learned a ton from those and changed a ton. Um, honestly, the things that I'm doing the same in my business, that's probably like a very short list mm -hmm. compared to the list of things that I'm changing. I've changed almost everything about what I do um, this year and will continue to heading into next year. And that looks like change of strategy. I've historically always done fix and flips. Um, now it's, it's much more open of a wide range like, hey, is this property best for a flip, a wholesale, a burr strategy with the rental? Like th there's just a lot more things that I'm looking at. Um, a change in price point. I haven't bought a 200K and under exit house in the last seven or eight months. Everything I'm doing now is in different price points and different neighborhoods that are a little bit more um, steady and just have like more consistency with buyers and stuff on the flip side. Um, changing my team, I think I mentioned, like had to you know let certain people go and figure out who to fill in that might be better. Um, or just areas where I should cut all together, cut back and, and tighten things up as you know the market got tough. So, so yeah, I mean, I'd say just all around, like kind of flipped everything <laughs> on its head that I'm doing. Well, you, you always had a very specific um, buy box. Uh, and I always like that about you. And obviously like you're adjusting that buy box. Do you, do you have a new one now? Are you just op more open to opportunities or how are you looking at new deals to do? I think right now my buy box is um, on the fix and flip stuff. I want um, good neighborhoods or like areas that have limited access. Like there's not a lot of inventory. People don't typically tend to sell. So some of the nicer areas of Gretna, um, Metairie, Kenner, Jefferson, just some of like kind of the hot button areas um, that are in the price range just above 200K and under. So I kind of want like those second to third time buyers who are a little bit more established, um, just, you know, an interest rate spike or something that happens in the market doesn't absolutely throw them off to where the house is just completely unaffordable and they're making these crazy decisions, you know, last minute, like getting cold feet. So price point is just a little bit higher, very specific on the area and then just like, I'm looking for houses that have kind of that wow factor, something special about it, something like it's on an extra big lot or it has a really great floor plan or layout where there's extra bedrooms or bathrooms and I can still price it at the same price as some of the not as wow factor uh, mm -hmm. comps. So that's on the flip side. And then pretty much everything that I've always historically done, the 200K and under single families, um, I'm only buying those to rent right now because it's just been that hard to sell them. Yep, yep. Uh, uh, tell me on the flip side, um, before we wrap up, um, is it, how's the buying like, right? Because obviously the selling's hard. It's always like when, when, it, when it's hard to sell, it's often easy to buy. And when it's hard to buy, it's often easy to sell. How, how are you finding the buying? Yeah, I think um, I probably haven't noticed that as much because I changed to a buy box that is historically harder to buy in. <laughs> you know, it's hard to find a great deer, deal in Metairie than Marrero or yep. something. So, um, so it hasn't been just like all these opportunities have opened up, but I will say, um, I mean, I have still been looking too in some of the areas that, you know, I've historically bought with the lower price points and it's definitely easier to negotiate um, to make offers like, yeah, the, the buying opportunities right now, which has also been great um, with switching to rentals in that price point. Um, I, I don't know about other people that do this, but typically for me, if I'm going to keep something as a rental, I typically have to have a little bit better of a spread on it than a flip because um, you got to meet those lender criteria to get the cash out refinance and stuff. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I'm finding deals that work as rentals in that price point where like historically, um, I haven't really been able to keep that many rentals in that price point and do like the full cash out refi because it's just so competitive and like yep. you can just, just barely skim enough profit to be like, that's a decent flip. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Any, any, any other changes or like, um, anything else you want to leave the audience with as we sort of wrap up, wrap up this, this part? Um, 
nothing crazy. I think that was that was a pretty good overview of kind of like what I've been experiencing this year. But I guess I would say, um, yeah, if you're like just getting started or, you know, it's it sounds like the year is so bad and like everything has gone to shambles. Um, it's it's still like a good career to be in. It's still a good market. There's still opportunities like I haven't stopped buying. I've just changed what I'm doing, doing, I'm, I've just changed strategy, changed price points, whatever it is to adjust, but it doesn't mean that, you know, it's not a good time or this isn't a good industry to be in. That's awesome. I really love what you said that you learn nothing when you win, like when it's easy, you won't learn nothing and you learn when it's hard. And like a lot of people, they go to university, right? And they study and they learn, they spend a lot of time and they come out with a bunch of debt. So like they spend a lot of time and money, you know? So sometimes when you take these losses, it's just like, it's just like, it's like learning, right? So you've, you've got a degree. So it's okay to lose some money sometimes, you know, as long as you keep going, you know. You know what they say, you don't, you don't drown from uh, falling in the water. You, you drown from not swimming, right? You know, so, so to keep going and, 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 and keep moving is, is definitely awesome. Cool, Dominic, I really appreciate you coming down. We're not gonna do questions in this, in this one, but Dominic, we, you come and drinks afterwards, right? Yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, so 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 we're gonna keep these ones. We're not gonna do questions, but most of the speakers are gonna come to drink. So come, ask her more questions, get more specific. But we want to get the pulse of different people, right? So um, thank you, Dominique. Um, give her thank a you. welcome. Uh, next, we want to get Stephen Leonard. Stephen Leonard up here. Um, while while Stephen's uh, walking up, um, I'll, I'll give you a bit of an intro. Um, you know, Steve, Steve's a very active um, uh, property manager in this market, uh, also a really big landlord. Uh, he owns uh, about 100 rental units himself. He manages uh, about 300, he manages a bunch of mine as well. So he's, he's really active and on the pulse. He does flip and do other things, but like uh, I know him as a, as a landlord and property manager. So um, welcome, Stephen. Thanks for coming out again. Thank you for having me. Awesome, man. So tell me, I mean, um, on the rental side, I mean, that's really where, where you're at mostly, right? Um, um, so what, what have been your main lessons for, for 23? 23, I think the biggest thing as far as my personal um, portfolio has been learning how to pivot a little bit. Um, <clears throat> as far as, you know, what the rental rate would be, you know, you might've went in thinking you're gonna get 1300, you may only get 1150. Um, bearing that in mind that insurances are high, taxes is, you know, they've gone up and I, I, I I hold a lot more weight against the insurance and hopefully that'll eventually start to change. That's, that's coming up for 24, but you know, that's, that's been the big thing for me is learning how to pivot and then um, holding back more reserves. At this point, it's, you know, if you're spending everything you're making, you're definitely going to have a hard time this year or this past year or going into 24. Yep. Yep. And are you, um, you know, um, what, what, what are you thinking about next year? Like, like how, how, how's that looking? What's your, what's your focus? Because you, you've been acquiring, I know you used to acquire a lot because you used to buy a lot often. Uh, um, you, you still will though, you still be tempted. Uh, but, but like how, how active have you been this year in your own Um, I'd say we definitely slowed down because we got a lot more choosier or pickier um, for the properties we were looking at. Um, you know, I mean, you and I had a conversation that I'm not really looking anymore. And then you said, hey, I got some deal coming up and, you know, okay, yeah, I'll take that too. I love, know? I love property people always. <laughs> you know, it doesn't always work, but it does work <laughs> quite a few times. Um, but that's just one of those things. It's, it's, it's for me. My desirable areas have have shrunk. Um, my criteria's have have enlarged. Um, meaning, you know, back in the day, you could determine what you wanted simply by getting me an address, and you know, I I look at the pictures, I could tell you, yeah, this is something I really want. Let me do my quick walkthrough, and I'm done. Um, but now you've got to, I've got to sit down with my insurance agent, get my numbers, you know, tightened up, you know, and then we've got to run the numbers to see not only what's active, but what's been renting. Um, if it's going to be a buy and hold, which typically my stuff is a buy and hold. Um, I think in this past year, we've only done maybe four to six flips, um, which is lower than I've done in the past, but you know, it just, it didn't work out for us that we, you know, would do that many. And, and in some cases we bought it as a flip and then intent and then decided to keep it as a buy and hold at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is having to pivot to, you know, maybe it wasn't by choice, um, like some would prefer it to be, but at the end of the day, you know, it, it, it's still making money. So knock on wood, it stays that way. Yep. 
And ha- has the what's the rental market been like in general? You've found it because it was really hot. I know before that, like ha- how how they found that. I feel, in, in my opinion, I, I've noticed the rental rates they've they've ticked down just a bit. Days on markets have increased. Um, so you know something that you could put on the market instead of it being gone in thirty days, now you're talking maybe forty five and sixty days. Um, as long as you've got an expectation of reality that you know, this is what the market's going to bear. I mean, it, there are times when people say, I want $1,600 for a rental, and we have to tell them as the bad guy, as the management company, well, it's only worth $1,450. Um, they don't like to hear that. No, I want $1,600. And then they want to get upset why it sits on the market for 60 and 90 days. You know, let's go back to where it started. You know, we said 14 you said 16 I'm giving you what you want, but I can't give you everything. Um, so... You know, knowing and, and being realistic at the end of the day is, is where it is. But for 24 with me and, and I guess the office in general and, and my portfolio, diversity, it's it's we're getting out of the market, not 100 percent. You know, again, you'll always be able to twist my arm a little bit. But at the end of the day, we are um, actively searching in the Mississippi and, and more the Moss Point um, Alabama area mobile it's it's we find the market from from what I've researched so far it seems to be what our market was previously here um, we've already acquired one in Moss Point we've talked about it in the past that we are looking to, to, to diversify out of Louisiana a little bit just because of cost here I can I can acquire you know two over there versus one here in some cases um, at least that's what the research research is showing. So next week we're meeting with the uh, agents that we're going to be working with Automobile, and you know we'll see where it really goes. I mean, as long as they're boots on the ground and hitting the ground like we would, I think we'll have a good uh, relationship. Mm-hmm. Awesome, cool man. Um, that's great. I really appreciate your feedback. Any anything anything that you haven't said that you wanted to say? See you at the drinks. <laughs> Steven, Steven definitely likes to drink. He'll definitely be at the drinks. Um, so if you want to. If you want to bend his ear about the markets he's talking about, if you want to talk about rentals and landlording and stuff, uh, he's a great person, great person to speak to. So let's give him a, a round of applause. Thanks, David. Thank Next up, we're going to get Chris, Chris Ginard up. Um, as, as Chris comes up, I'll introduce him a little bit. Uh, Chris has been in, the, in our market a long time, uh, very experienced investor, done a lot of things, um, you know, uh, rehab, rentals, new builds, storage. Um, he spoke about when he came and spoke uh, and did his um, speech at our at our meetup. He really spoke about being opportunistic and seeing what you know what the opportunities are at any one time. So I'm definitely interested to um, pick his brain. So thanks for coming, Chris. Absolutely, happy so, to be here. Awesome, man. We really appreciate it. So tell me, you know, what what did you what what are your lessons from 23? Like, how did, how did you find this year? Um, I wish I would have sold a lot more last year. Mm. Um, so. When I first started in New Orleans, it was doing the last downturn back in 2008, 2009, 2010. So what, is ha- what has happened between 2010 and now? It's pretty much been all growing, right? Mm. And I've acquired a lot of assets here in this market. And so you know real estate's peaks and valleys, right? It's not going to you're not going to ride the gravy train forever right and it's it, it's how you manage your inventory in up and down markets right i would love to be focusing get the mic. all my time right now on purely acquiring property because i think as you mentioned absolutely when time gets tough those create very good buying opportunities but also is how do you manage the inventory that you have now due to all the things that are happening in the market with the with the last uh guy that was up here insurance is a real killer i mean it, it is a very big issue here in this market, especially if you're a holder of, of rentals and you're a cash flow investor. Um, for the first time, I actually had my insurance agent, which is Arthur Gallagher, they're nationwide. I had him pull a list and give me the markets that have the cheapest insurance rates. And I'm, go- I'm sitting there going, wow, my investment criteria has happened to go down to where insurance rates are low. Right, because your biggest expenses is your taxes and your insurance. Right, those are your two biggest expenses. Um, Those make the biggest impact on your bottom line. And so, when I say what my biggest probably regret is, I sold a lot of property in '22. I just wish I would have sold a lot more. Mm. Right, because 
people were buying. So now there's a lot of properties that, that I'm trying to sell now that they're not moving, right? So I'm selling, I'm actually selling one at the end of this month that I pivoted and I'm selling on bond for deed, right? So you have two choices if you have a property you're trying to sell, right? You can hold your price or drop your price. You can sell on price or you can sell on terms. So me, I'm going, I'd rather sell on terms and hold my price. I'm just waiting to get my payout, right? Or you can drop your price and you may take a loss or whatever that may be. And the first guest, he says, all right, who, uh, what, was, what was Dominique? Dominique, she says she plays in the 200 and below. Well, in the 200 and below, you have a lot of exit strategies in the 200 and below. If, you, if it doesn't sell, you can rent it. If it doesn't sell, you can sell it on a bond for deed. So, but when you when you play in the higher price points, you don't really have a lot of options other than just drop price, right? So that's why that first time home buyer is always a probably the safest arena to play in. Um, I like that strategy. And, and me, I had a lot of B and Bs because I got caught up in that craze, like a lot mm -hmm. of people did, where I built a lot of them brand new. And I don't know if some of y'all were here for my first talk. One of my biggest criteria is replacement cost am i acquiring an asset for cheaper than what i can build it new right i built a lot of new construction rentals in 15 and 16 that i regret right because i'm building it at today's cost right and especially now with the labor cost where they're at i don't see how anybody can do it i really don't um <laughs> so so I'm pivoting to a strategy of I'm not dropping my price. I'm going to sell on terms. So when you sell on terms, you could, you know, say your interest rate that you have on a property is say 5%, right? Well, the going rate right now is 9%. So if I sell on terms, I'm going to sell at 9% and I'm just going to make a spread and just hold on the property. And I'll give a, I'll give someone one to two years to buy me out, right? I'll give them a two year balloon, one or two year balloon. So I'm just basically waiting to get my back end profit instead of dropping my price. So th that's kind of the strategy I'm pivoting to now. Um, also, in, in not investing in New Orleans anymore. I'm really kind of very uh, bearish on New Orleans. I don't like what's going on. Um, it's in flux. Um, uh, they can't figure out, the municipalities can't figure out what they're doing. You talking uh, uh, Orleans Parish or are you talking Parish. Greater Orleans, New Orleans, Orleans, Orleans Parish. Parish? Yeah. I do have, I do have a, a, a bigger size development in on Jefferson Highway right now that I'm excited about and dealing with Jefferson Parish is night and day yeah different than Orleans Parish right now um, so I've heard, I've heard that a lot so um, also uh, you know moving forward I'm making a big pivot to where you know I had a lot of rentals here so I did a lot of in-house property management I had staff I'm getting away from that uh, more I'm, I'm kind of pivoting my business more to asset management because what I do is I raise money to come in the deals and then so instead of taking um you know a 10 percent management fee i'll um i'll charge an asset management fee of one to two percent for managing the investment basically managing the entity um for the investors that are in the project which is a lot better than managing property because if you manage a property you manage employees right and we all know the headache sometimes of employees they're hard to find hard to find good ones that is so typical growing pains um, um, storage is uh, is is still one of my favorite asset classes now it is taking a dip just like multifamily is um, because you have a pause in the market I mean you have a pause in home buying right people aren't moving around as, as much as they were over the last year so I, my facilities were giving bigger discounts uh, we're dropping rates to get them in. The issue is, it's all about churn of your of your tenants, right? So if we're dropping rates to keep occupancy, you may have somebody that was paying a dollar fifty a dollar fifty a square foot or one hundred and fifty dollars for a ten by ten. They're moving out at one hundred and fifty, but my rate went down to a dollar twenty a square foot, so I'm replacing them with a with a hundred and twenty dollar tenant versus one fifty, mm -hmm. right? So that's happening um, right now, but the good thing is I bought these properties good enough to where we're good, but a lot of people can't say the same about it because I go back to 
you see a lot of new storage, new facilities going up, ground up construction, right? To build these big facilities, you're spending $10 million, close to, you know, $70 a square foot. If you build, you know, 100,000 square foot facility, that's $7 million, right? So I, well, that's why I love the conversions because my price, our price point that we can get in is maybe half of a new facility. I'm getting the same amount of square footage. That's why I like the conversions. I'm going to stick to that criteria. Um, really with the amount of labor costs and where they've been, I just, I'm just not big on new construction right now. Where, hey, where else you seen opportunities? Because I know you're opportunistic. You, you tend to like, you've done a lot of things and you tend to flow with the market. Yeah. Like where, where do you see the opportunities in 24, or, you know, maybe? So I play a lot in the tax lien space. I love tax liens um, with paper. So I, 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 I play more in the secondary tax lien space where these uh, institutional buyers, um, basically create these debt funds. They go to the auction or they go to the municipality, they buy tapes of liens, right? And they do it for arbitrage. Their cost of their money may be, um, you know, 6%. They're getting 12 to 18% on the paper and they're making a spread. But what happens when these homeowners don't pay their taxes, they got to foreclose on the asset. So what happens is that that buyer, that, in, that institutional buyer mandates, mandate of his fund doesn't allow him to manage and own real estate, right? They're just paper investors, just debt investors. So I'm buying it from them at really cheap at a little bit of a premium. Mm. So um, um, that's been a, a target of mine uh, lately where I just bought 66 homes in, in Rochester, New York, of all places. Um, but I bought them at about 12,500 a house. That sounds, below, and, that sounds below replacement value. Right. <laughs> you can't build the house, right? You barely can pour foundation for that, right? And of course, not including the land. Um, so that's something I created a fund. So I'm, I'm raising money into that fund, and, and we're going to improve that portfolio and have the ability of the same same seller to acquire more. Like I, I can acquire 16 more that I'm in due diligence right now, looking at those. I'm paying those 15,000 a house. Mm -hmm. So some of the houses need $10,000, some of them need 50,000. But if you look at across a portfolio, you're in it for about 50,000 a house, 50 to 60,000 a house, and they rent for $1,300 a month. It's good math, right? But again, those opportunities may not be available in your market. So I've got very good at saying, I wanna go where there's opportunity and not just say, I'm just gonna invest here, right? So there are opportunities everywhere if you, if you know where to look. Uh, and not be afraid to to invest out of your market. And that would be my biggest advice. Right awesome. Now. Okay, that's that's really great. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, thanks so much. You're gonna come for drinks afterwards? Yeah, maybe so. Okay, we might have to pick his brain a little bit more. Um, really appreciate it. Thank, thanks, Chris. So um, Anitra is going to be next, but I'm also going to introduce, we've got the Emil Hurst Jr. in the building, who I'll get him to take over the interviewing because he does that best. So uh, I'll let Emil and Anitra. Make sure you log on to YouTube and check out Vertical at Vertical Capital. This is real estate from a lender's perspective. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Let's get into it. So lessons learned in 2023. So, and what are we doing moving forward in 2024? Yep. yep. Uh, so from, like you said, from the lender's perspective, ours is more not financial Was your but, yeah i'm sorry about that yeah. but more on a behavioral side right um we learned that everyone does not value relationships and partnerships the same um we learned that a lot of people you use relationships or they use that word loosely right mm. and no and so the value uh you look a lot of people think uh, a relationship is like one off transactional and don't realize that it should be a long you when you enter into that relationship you should enter it with a mindset of long term even exchange of value mm. so that was kind of hard uh, for us because uh, my business partner and I we believe in giving value every step of the way to our borrowers no matter what the situation is um, and so there were a lot of times where we would 
try to not allow our emotions or the response from one of our partnerships or a borrower to dictate how we do our business, right? And so we're gonna continue to add that value. And what I mean by that is I had, for the first time, we had to take back two properties within one in September and one last week um, where the borrower, both borrowers were just completely non-communal, mm -hmm. right? And borrower number one, although he was non-communal, we still were able to find him another lender to cash us out. And so that's what I mean when I say about those long-term relationships, because we create relationships with other lenders as well mm -hmm. that can possibly cash you out of our deal. And then that's another relationship that you can forge as a borrower. But when you become uh, absent, mm -hmm. that makes it hard. And so this guy, uh, bo both loans terms went into a year. We were now approaching a year. Uh, they were behind four, five, six months uh, of payments. And we still came to the table with his appraisal money for the new lender. Mm. Uh, and I also came up with some other costs to get him to the finish line. And so I could have, I took his property and in seven days I sold the property back to him, right? Now I could have been a jerk because his grandmother was in the property. And that's what I mean when I say not allowing my emotions to dictate to me how I'm gonna do business with someone and continue to add value to that person. And on the day of the closing, he was so grateful, he was so thankful. Uh, I was able to, the, the new lender was happy as well, although he had these behavior issues with non-payment. I try to keep up with that, I think he's doing very well now. Uh, but again, that to be able to do that, to be able to come behind somebody who's behind on their payments and still make the payment for their appraisal, that comes with the underwriting. Mm. <laughs> so on this particular property, what he owed us, in addition to the additional costs that I add on to this loan, plus what he needed to qualify for the new lender, um, he was still all in like 260 on a property that appraised for 410. Right, so that that came in on our underwriting on the on the first half. Mm. So again, building relationships because I'm not going to bring the second lender no junk. So I have to make sure that my underwriting is tight on the front end. Any event that this is going to happen, right? And of course, we're in a market where it's going to happen. But I'm not interested in taking your property. I'm interested in in helping you get across the bridge right now i know there's gonna there's there's a we have a couple of people that are late right now mm. you know and so what can i do as a lender to help you get across or to help us get through uh this moment you know our underwriting we adjusted our underwriting two years ago i'm not an economist but i do follow economic channels and things of that nature going to conferences and stuff like that that helps right and so two years ago we were told to adjust our underwriting and we I, did that. I think that's a good segue. So we're going to take <laughs> what we did two years ago and what does that look like for 2024? How we, how we, I'm, I'm not, it? I'm not changing it. Mm. Um, I think where we're at, we're good. Our, we, we lend up to 65% on average. We're at about 61 to 62%. So I'm going to stick, we're going to stick it there. We're going to stay there. It's worked so far. Um, again, um, if I have to get rid of some other property, I don't want to become a landlord. I've, I've been there, done that. You know, I started, I started my investment journey in uh, 2002. So, I mean, 2004, but I'm not interested in using vertical capital as a landlord. Mm. So in that case, I have to underwrite, you know, tight on the, on the front end or whatnot, but I can't dictate someone's behavior either. Mm -hmm but I can kind of gauge it a little bit by just continuing to extend that arm, right? Even if you don't answer my emails, even if you don't answer my text messages, I'm still gonna send them to you. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's good. So are you coming for drinks after? Hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully okay. you're coming. Up. All right, well, let's give it up for Anitra at Vertical right. Capital. Thanks. <laughs> we got, still, all right. 
Baton Rouge in the building. So still. <laughs> I don't know what y'all talking about. Right there, it's fine. Huh? Oh, I was doing. <laughs> A little bit more great in the last uh, meetup in a bit. Yeah. Good to see you, Sterling. That uh, the uh, looking good, bro. Looking good. So lessons learned in 2023 and how are we adjusting in 2024. Man, I don't even know where to start. So I play around in a few different sandboxes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I have my apartment syndications and then I have my rental portfolio and then I, and then I had the flips and, um, I got kicked in the teeth pretty hard on the flips in 2023. Mm. And, um, as a result of that, I had to sell more of my rental portfolio than I would have preferred to kind of cover those losses. Mm. Um, we also had some apartment complexes that didn't, I mean, they, they haven't failed, but they're just not performing the way we had originally underwritten. Mm -hmm. um, some of that is to do with variable rates and some of it's to do with mismanagement. So the, the, the key lessons, I would say, if I just kind of had to bullet point it out real quick, um, one of them is not to be so market cycle dependent. So like when I got into real estate investing, I just wanted to be a full-time real estate investor. I didn't want to do anything else. I didn't want to manage property. I didn't want to manage construction. I didn't want to be a realtor. I didn't want to be a lender. I just wanted to be a real estate investor. And, and that was great when it was great, when I could make a hundred K a flip with you know, not even trying, but when it stopped being great, it stopped being great like that. Yeah. And so it, it made, it made me kind of want to pivot. And so what we did this year is we started a property management and a construction business. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's been great. You know, where, what I, you know, where, what I did right over the years is two things. I started buying rentals and stacking rentals long before I ever flipped a house. Mm -hmm. So, because I knew flipping was risky. I just did it anyway, eventually. And, um, the, the other thing I, I did was um, marketed myself very well. Mm. So between the podcast and the meetup and coming to y'all's meetups and speaking, I, I built a, a good network. So when the market turned and I couldn't sell a house to save my life, and I figured that out before Don did because I remember her on my podcast back in April. I'm like, I'm dying. She's like, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> and And so... So I, you know, we started the property management company at the beginning of 2023. Mm -hmm. We started the construction company about halfway through. Um, but uh, I just, I just want to continue going into 2024. I would, I haven't bought a, I haven't bought a house to flip this year. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've sold a few, I've sold a few of the rentals, but going forward, when the market comes back, cause it will get back and we all have short time term memory and we'll forget about this. Just like the guys forgot about 2008 and did it again and flew close too close to the sun this year, you yeah. know, but going forward, I'm going to continue to maintain the service work, you know, the, the, the construction and the property management, and I'm going to be more selective about the houses I flip. Mm. So I just, I just bought way too many, you know, yeah. it, it, beginning of 2022, we were just killing it a hundred K a house, like clockwork. Yeah. And I was like, well, this is great. We need to buy 20 of them. Yeah. And, and then, and then we kind of got sandwiched between the inflation on the front end, making our material costs through the roof. And then to combat the inflation, the fed jacked up the rates and we got smashed on the back end trying to sell them. So, I mean, we had houses that, that we ended up selling, 150k less than we had anticipated mm -hmm. um so i had houses that i should have made 100k on that i lost 30k on um the other the other lesson i would say i learned in the in the apartment syndication space is uh that i don't necessarily want to raise capital and partner with with other operators mm -hmm. um you know being younger and newer in the space, you, you, you want to kind of latch on to these really experienced guys mm -hmm. with all these properties and all this money. And it seems like a wise move. Well, in retrospect, I can tell you all of the property, all of the apartment complexes that I'm operating mm -hmm. are doing fine. Mm -hmm. Whereas the ones that I'm not in control are the one where they're doing, where they're distressed and having capital cost situations and, and kind of stuff like that. So um, I find that the two breaking points outside of 2023, mm -hmm. I find the two breaking points are if I'm not operating the deal or a third party property management company. Mm -hmm. So going forward in 2024, 
we are the property management company. So I never have to worry about another third party, which I've been through many. Yeah. Um, and, and we're not going to, we're not going to do any deals that we're not operating. Yeah. Um, we'll continue. I mean, we'll start flipping again when, the, when, when the market stabilizes, I was telling Steve outside, I don't even need the rates to go down. I just need the world to get used to where they're at. Mm. You know, I was at my meetup in Baton Rouge last night and, and, and I remember the first house I bought in the summer of 2018, I was happy as shit to, to pay a uh, 6.75 interest rate mm. on this little rental property. Mm. You know what I mean? And, and then I bought another one, another one, another one at, the, at those rates. And then, you know, we got spoiled and, you know, after COVID when it was two and a half percent, but we're really not that far off from where, where I started. Mm. Um, so, so the, you know, the kind of lessons I learned is, you know, the more control you have, the better. Yeah. Um, it's, it's usually not wise to, to trust third party property management company, unless it's Crestworth property management, you can trust <laughs> them. They're great. And, um, yeah. And, and, and just be, be agile and ready to pivot, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest, the stacking all those rentals saved me. Mm. If I would have just gone in as a flipper this year, I would be bankrupt. Mm. The only reason I'm not bankrupt. I mean, I lost millions. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But the only reason, the only thing that saved me was I had that huge rental portfolio to cover my losses. And then I had the network from marketing for so long to where when I pivoted to the property management and construction, I just had a flood of business overnight. Mm-hmm. Like the, the second we, you know, got licensed and started managing other people's properties. I mean, we just, we, we tripled overnight. Mm-hmm. And so, um, that, that's kind of my take on it. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you coming out, man. And it, Steve, it's hard for me to bite my tongue right now. It's- so many questions I want to ask right now, but we got to keep it on the tip. Yeah, drinks, bro. Yeah, okay. So you'll be there at drink. Okay, so we'll dig a little bit more, but thank you for taking a drive Absolutely. and uh, hanging out with us still. All right, give it up for still. All right. Appreciate you, bro. Courtney, all right. North Shore in the house. What's up, Courtney? What up, what up? How we doing? I'm doing good. Sterling gave me shit because I had to put my thoughts on paper. <laughs> so tell us, lessons learned in 2023, and what are, what are we doing different in uh, 2024? So as a creative real estate investor, I am busier than I've ever been in nearly the last 10 years right now. Mm. Um, so 2023 has been has been quite a year for me. So I did write down my thoughts so I can get them down here and also be conscious of time. Okay. Um, so one of the things is just the concept that creative financing. So so to give you an idea, if you don't know me already, you can watch the video on the YouTube channel. Um, I buy a lot of stuff with creative financing that's utilizing the seller or their existing financing, um, usually for rentals or I'm selling the stuff on terms. Um, so, so like rent to own, stuff like that. Um, creative financing has allowed me to legally and ethically manipulate the market. So when everyone was crying about 8%, I was out there buying properties subject to a 3% loan or buying a seller finance deal at 0% interest, right? Um, So when the market really crunched, all I had to do was up my skills to to utilize. I'm done already? Time. (laughs) Time. (laughs) So it's the idea that the skill sets that I have been able to use have allowed me to to overcome what really stopped people in their tracks in the market, mm-hmm. right? Um, so really just seeing, you know, it, it, it allowed me to take the, uh, the market and take those pain points really out of being a pain point for myself. Um, so obviously creative financing is king right now. Multiple people mentioned it, um, but you have to learn how to do it safely and correctly. The number one phone call I am getting right now is investor rescue phone calls. I lost count how many I've had this week. Also because I just got back in town, so I don't know what day it is. But but no, seriously, people who flips have gone wrong, Airbnb issues, bought a property, doing Airbnb, had, you know, aggressive financing with it, things changed with that, now they're stuck. Um, Have people who were attempting to do the Burr method, now they, it doesn't, the numbers don't work when they go to 
to, to do the refinance, um, or they structured a creative deal and they can no longer handle doing, making the payments because it's sitting longer to rent, um, or it is, um, they didn't structure it correctly and they're just drowning right now. Uh, and their ability to keep swimming, to your point, Steve, is uh, just not happening. I am getting so many of those that it's, I, I don't know how to wrap my head around it to a degree where I say, I truly want to help. But what's also difficult in 2023 is I had to learn to say no to people. Historically, I've been the type of person where I'm like, I'm not going to tell you what I can't do. I'll tell you what I will do, right? And there, let me make you my creative offer. I've been able to make a lot of deals work in our market that a lot of other investors can't between my work with title issues and then you know structuring things creatively. Um, I've had to get okay with telling people no and, and, and not forcing a deal. Partnering with Steve has helped me because I like the chess of solving a deal. I like taking something and saying, okay, how can I, how can I do it? But I've had to learn to not force deals because when you force a deal, when you agree to give up doing a great deal by just doing a good deal where the numbers are marginal, when something happens, interest rates, property taxes, insurance rates, the market slows down, whatever, your great deal goes to good deal. But if you took a marginal deal, it goes from good to bad. And those are those investor rescues that we're seeing. Um, and so that's also something you be very careful. You don't want to get into marginal deals right now. Um, so cash flow has been my defense. Money in the bank, straight up, money in the bank. Um, you've heard me share before, that I use other people's money to acquire properties. And I've said it that I, the money in-house, the profit and the cash flow that the rentals make has been my defense. More than ever, that is allowing me to stay in this game. Bless you. Um, your team, 2023 taught me that you and your team have to have skills, um, point blank. If your team doesn't have real skills, um, you're gonna find out real quick. So it goes back to a, um, a great quote that says, no plan, no matter how well thought out, doesn't survive first contact with your enemy. What does that mean? You can have a really great plan, but when shit hits the fan, it, you know, how is it gonna hold up? And that is what we're finding in this market right now is a lot of people had great plans, or as someone else put it, we had a lot of spreadsheet people who the numbers looked good on paper, but when the market came to bear the real fruit of what was going on, it doesn't look so great. Um, so I do think if I were to give 2023 a word, it would be the wartime generals came out to play. And the peacetime generals, they had to sit down. What does that mean? The people who know how to get stuff done or who, as Mike Tyson said, you know, you have a plan until you get punched in the face. Well, what do you do? Do you stop fighting? Or did you, you know, put a tampon in your nose and start keep going? I'm like, what do you do? Right? Y'all are so going to cut that up and put that on here. Um, whatever. But it's that idea, right? How many people got, got beat up during this, you know, 2023 with something? A deal didn't go as planned. Well, what are you doing? Are you sitting on the side or are you quickly readjusting, re-getting the troops engaged and going back out to, to combat, combat the enemy or, you know, a tough market. So that's 2023, is I just, I wanna be a good, my lesson from 2023 is I just, I wanna continue to be a good wartime general when things are tough. I wanna know how to, to pivot quickly and how to be able to handle myself in a way that um, I can play both defense and offense. So my focus for 2024, mm -hmm. historically, past 10 years, I bought 60% of my deals with private money, 40% with creative financing. Last year, I bought 80% of my deals with creative financing, so subject to seller financing, and 20% uh, with private money. I think next year, I'm gonna go 90% creative financing, 10% private money. Um, continuing, to offset the difficulties in the market by having the sellers through buying subject to their existing loan or buying with terms with seller financing just to continue to ma manipulate the market but bring in some co-responsibility, some um, continue to have the sellers share in the, the risk 
for the market with me. The reason why that is I don't believe the pain is done. Very specifically for Louisiana, 2024 is a quadrennial property tax assessment. Orleans is the only one that does it in advance, and we saw that earlier when in July when the tax rolls were open and everyone was wailing and crying. Every other parish is going to get that next, next year, and I think that the pain is not done. I think that there's still more pain, uh, so what am I going to do? I'm going to get very, I'm very focused. I've said a no to a lot of things, um, more announcements to come, but I've been saying no to a lot of things in my life recently because now is the time for me to go to work. With my skill sets, now is the time for me to feast, and so, uh, and I don't think it's done. I don't, I don't think that we're, you know, trending out of it. I, I, I do think we still have some more waiting to go in the water, so... I'm focusing on having cash flow from other sources. Um, earlier this year, right after the summer, I brought on another partner and we're focusing on uh, buying land and selling it on terms and buying land with mobile homes, selling that on terms, basically notes and other type of things like that, lot rent and stuff like that. Why? Because that is that is cash flow that doesn't demand a lot. You wanna know how many, how many ACs I've been in properties this summer or because, you know, roofs I had to replace that I didn't have to because of insurance, what do I need? I need cash flow from other sources that don't demand a lot, but they take one for the team and they keep the rest of the boat afloat. Um, right now, 2024, I just ironed out my, my uh, goals for the year. I am, for those who know, part of my plan is I have what's called a legacy portfolio. These are the nicer houses, two fit, you know, 250 to 350 ARV, um, 1990 newer in the nice houses and nice neighborhoods, I am buying them very aggressively because right now they're on sale and they're not often on sale. I literally have 18 leads on my board at home right now for these nicer, na nicer houses and nicer neighborhoods that I can buy subject to or it's seller financing or something like that. Um, so I'm busier than ever. So again, it's coming back down to that focus. Will I get them all? No. But if I can get a few, now is the time for me to really build out that legacy portfolio. Um, so I'm doing that through strong relationships and strong a strong brand, and I'm quadrupling down on that in 2024. Um, I'm gonna launch uh, my podcast and my YouTube channel. I'm tripling down on that because um, that is truly, 95% of my deals come from other people, right? So I'm tripling down on what has worked. Um, last thing I'll say is this, is uh, I usually read 40 to 60 books a year. In 2024, I'm not allowing myself to read anything um, other than one of my top five mentors is a guy by the name of Jack Miller. He's no longer alive. Most of you probably don't know him. Um, but he's one of my five mentors. All four of the others have been mentored by him, right? Um, from... October of 1978 until when he died in 2009, he wrote a newsletter every year, every month. So every single month, it was like a six, you know, six page newsletter. I have almost all of them and I wanna read through them. One, because I wanna continue to study cycles, but number two, I, wanna, I want to study what someone has to become as a creative investor, because he wrote as a creative investor in the single family space. Who do you have to become when times change? that wartime general is what I'm talking about. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm telling my ass to sit down and read them. Like, cause I've been reading here and there, but I wanna go through them. Um, so that's my main focus, some of my main focuses for 2024. Uh, you guys can follow along. Go to CourtneyFricky.com, they have my Instagram on there. Um, I love to, my goal is to document it along the way, but head down, eyes focused, and that's really where I'm at right now. Yeah, well, we appreciate it, Courtney, and uh, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you I'm still stuck on a tampon in the nose. <laughs> I, yeah, I knew it. I, I, knew. Didn't, I didn't even stop thinking about it. So That's the only question with that. <laughs> <laughs> Courtney, freaking everybody. <laughs> Who we got? You, Aussie? Oh, man. Okay. Good day, mate. Good day, mate. How you doing? All right, all right. All right. <laughs> Lessons learned in 2023, and what we doing moving forward, uh, 2024. What we at on time? 
So we're doing good. We're doing good actually. Okay. Yeah, you're, right. you're gonna get some. Okay. Um. Right. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I think I think the main lessons I got uh in 23 uh I'll actually I'll actually uh credit Chris Rude for crystallizing it. Uh, Chris Rude spoke uh a lot about um you got to focus on there's fast money, medium money, and slow money, right? And I, I think that's really important. And the whole idea behind that is that like slow money is rentals, right? It's wealth building. It's you know. It's it's long term wealth uh, accumulation, but it doesn't does, it pays you slow doesn't do much right. Fast money is is wholesaling a really quick flip a W two job is fast money right. You work and you get paid the next week or two weeks. You, you're getting paid you know quickly. You know medium time medium term money is maybe a large flip flip could go either way. But like a large flip a land development something maybe you're buying subject to and selling on uh, bond for diva ballooning three years. So just that concept, and when he spoke about that, I realized like I'd gone on a bit of a rip on short term, um, short term, slow money, slow money. Sorry. So you know, uh, I in 2022, I bought a lot of burrs. Uh, I, I did 18, I, I did 19 burrs over about 15 months, which is slow for sterling. <laughs> but um, but um, so I, d I did a lot of birds and they're really good assets. Like 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 I love those assets, but it's slow money, right? Like I'm not I'm not making much from that, particularly when you factor in the insurance that everyone's spoken about. Like some of those turn negative, some of those are positive. So they're slightly negative, um, and they're great assets. They're paying down. Like I love them, but they're not paying me now. So. You know, uh, also wholesale. So I do a bit, a bit of wholesale. Wholesaling is fast money. So just listening to Chris crystallize that made me realize that, like, I don't need the slow money right now, right? I I, I built a nice little portfolio. Like I have shares in my other company home. So I, I actually got quite a lot of slow money. So I'm like, I need I need to go, uh, the, the 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 quick money. So that that's really my biggest lesson. Just crystallizing that. It, it came up through our meetup. Like I know you were hearing. Um, Emil, like Sterling, talk about also having a W two and these people like getting this fast money as well. So um, I think that was really the the the, the biggest lesson, uh, and I think really Chris crystallized um, that for me. Um, I also think uh, I did learn a lesson that like um, property is pretty resilient, right? Uh, it's funny because I mean that like I mean the vibe is a little bit negative from tonight, right? Like because it's it's tough right now, but also like on the on the long-term asset point of view, like um, property prices didn't really go down. Like, do you know how fast the interest rates went up? Like historically, the speed at which, which interest rate went up is crazy, mm. right? And yes, it tanked, it tanked um, transactions, which I know most people in this room, that hurts, right? If you, transactions is hurting realtors, mortgage providers, like everyone, right? So it, yes, the market, I think real estate's in a recession from a transaction point of view, but the assets themselves are pretty damn strong. Even the multifamilies, right? Like Sterling, even these, even like there's a lot of pain in commercial. There's a lot of pain because he's bridge debt and people are going to get hurt because of the debt. But the asset's a really good asset, right? So I think my lesson is um, real estate's resilient. Um, and I think that's a positive thing. Uh, I'm actually like, I'll uh, maybe talk a little bit about 24 in terms of like, I'm actually aggressive. Like in hearing a lot of the flippers talk about not like, like pulling back, that makes me get excited because like I want to buy everything because <laughs> like you know or Warren Buffett when people are, are, are scared you, you should be greedy when people are greedy you should be scared you know so like I, I'm actually I'm low-key excited um, about about what's coming about what's coming mm -hmm. um, because real estate is never perfect if you're particularly a flipper for flippers in the house I'm not much of a flipper although literally I bought my first flip so so it sounds funny right if all these flippers are out here bleeding and I'm like I'm gonna try it um, <laughs> but, 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 uh, but I like to be kind of cyclical to be honest with you. Um, so, but, uh, it's never a good time, like, because when it's, it's been really good to sell deals the last, like not now, but like historically the, the couple of years before, like selling deal, how, how many, how many offers were you all getting on your properties, right? Like they were flying off above and that's awesome. But what was it like to buy them? It was hard. It was tough. Like you couldn't, you couldn't buy them, right? So now, now we've flipped. Yeah, it's hard to sell for sure, but it's much easier to buy. So you know, you ne you never, it's never going to be easy to buy and a great time to sell. Like it just, it just is never going to exist. So we need to adjust. So you know, for me, um, for me, like I'm focused next year. Uh, I'm feeling actually more aggressive, just because because of what's going on. Um, 
my focus really is just uh, fast money, you know, doing a lot of wholesaling because I, I wholesale a bunch. Uh, so I want to lean into that more. Uh, I'm really focusing on the disposition side of wholesaling, right? Selling the deals because it is harder to sell, right? And um, I, I think of wholesaling as a two-sided marketplace, right? So my, my background is tech. I had a tech company that was a two-sided marketplace. You know, you and a two-sided marketplace is a really um, normal business model. There's lots of, you can read a lot about it, right? And and that's just, a uh, two-sided marketplace is connecting two different people and making life easier. So, you know, for wholesaling, you've got a seller who has a problem property and they need a solution. They need a fast sale, an easy sale. They need to like not worry about the fact there's a hole in the roof. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, like they need, that's what they need, right? Um, so your job is to make that really easy. And I think, I think most wholesalers get that. But the flip side of that two-sided marketplace is the buyers are the other side, right? The buyers also need a frictionless service, right? The, the flippers particularly, they, they need deals on a platter, right? They don't want to negotiate, call. They want a deal. They want to make it easy. They want a nice closing. Like they, they want service and better do it, you know? So, so I think that's the other side and the two-sided marketplaces are never in balance, right? And sometimes other ones are more important and it has been a selling seat. If you got a contract two years ago, you're selling that thing, right? Like you just, it's easy to move. Now it's reversed, it's harder to sell because you know there's less buyer, the buyer pool is smaller. So for me, I really wanna lean into that. Uh, I'm just focusing more on um, dispositions, like I'm hiring a disposition person for my company because I'd, I'd historically done it myself, um, but I'm hiring someone so that we can focus more on like hearing what our buyers need, understanding their pain points, understanding what they're after, making sure that we can find the deals they want, sell them, um, and why it's easy to buy and just make sure we're getting the right prices. So I'm really digging down to that. I'm not so focused on the slow money right now. I do long term, I mean, rentals are my favorite thing. Like I like, like they're my favorite thing, but I don't need more now, right? I did a whole run, like that's cool. I'll let that settle and I'll get aggressive again. But um, yeah, I mean, that's really my focus. And definitely I think the other lesson, the other thing I'm focusing on is the network, right? Like people in this room, like the, the, you know, co uh, co co cooperation over competition, right? You know, I did a lot of JVs this year. So I really found like a lot of people would come to me to move the deals uh, and that's great. Um, you know, a lot of um, working with Courtney, we've done a lot of deals together too that we are bought, you know, cause she's great at, you know, creative financing as you hear and I'm not, you know, but I'm, I'm good at marketing and finding leads and systems. So, you know, working with her. Um, so, you know, I, I just think that the relationships are important. I want to build more of the relationships, build out disposition. And I'm, I'm aggressive, um, actually. Yeah. Good stuff. Cool. So 2024, dispositions. 2023, lessons learned. Yep. So, so, so the lessons that is the fast money, slow money. So, so 24, okay. 2024, focusing on dispositions, focusing on fast money, um, you know, focusing on more uh, relationships. I'm going to do a couple of flips. And, like, again, like, I, I don't, I don't want to be a flipper, to be honest with you. Like, it's not... Uh, if you heard me speak, I normally say I'm never going to flip because my, my skill is sales and marketing. But I sort of want to flip um, for a couple reasons. Uh, firstly, I think it'll make me a better wholesaler, right? Me, me doing a lot of burrs, I think made me a much better wholesaler because like I actually have properties, I understand them, I have rentals, like, like it made me better. But I'm not much of a flipper, right? So I want to flip so that like I understand flippers more, I go deeper into the rehab process. So I think it'll make me a better wholesaler. Um, also, like, I just want extra, extra strat exit strategies because you hear some of the flippers are scared right, right now, right? If they're scared, like, I, if I think there's a deal, I'll take that risk, right? Um, because, you know, historically, if, it's a, if it needs a flip, like, I'll take a really low assignment fee. Like, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll sell a deal, I'll get 2K, right, that I've put a lot of work into, a lot of marketing into. I'll just sell it to move it because I'm not a, not a flipper. But, like, hey, if I'm getting a 2K offer, if, it's, if I'm going to make 2K and I believe in the deal, I'm just going to take it down myself, you know, and that, that's, I just want to build that, that element too. Yeah. So we have time. I mean, we've done good on the time. I was really, what this, so just firstly, uh, this format was a bit ambitious, like, and I really appreciate the speakers that came. Like, we've got some really good speakers to come and just spend a short amount of time. So it was an um, ambitious um, agenda and we're trying to be really tempted not to ask too many questions. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, but we got time for you, Emil. So, so yeah. I'm 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 gonna turn I'm gonna turn the um, the mic to you and ask you what were, what were your uh, lessons in 23? Yeah. Uh, so 2023 kind of for me 
less of a lesson, but more of a confirmation on just the nature of real estate. So uh, next year, make 10 years that I was in a business and I've been through it enough now to just know that the things that happen to us in this business is just nature. Like nothing surprises me anymore. Like it's, it's going to take more time for anything to happen. Uh, the other side of the table is not going to come up to your expectations and it's going to cost more money. So now when these things happen, I'm just, it just is what it is. It's, it's nature. So if it, if the wind blows and it rains outside with real estate, deals fall apart, things take longer to happen. So with that being said, now uh, I go into the deal with a lens of just being prepared for whatever the worst case scenario is. So that way, whenever it happens, I'm not even surprised. Um, so that that's, that's the biggest takeaway for me, including human behavior, what Anisha talked about. Like with sellers, with buyers, with vendors, I'm not even surprised. Like when people do anything outside of what I expected, it's fine. Like I'm, I'm used to it. It's fine. Mm -hmm. So just getting a, a, a grasp on like just understanding it. And I think that makes you lethal uh, in a business to where you're not blindsided as much because you walking into the situation knowing exactly what they expect. So with that being said, like this year was the year of liquidity. Like I talked about the end of last year. So I picked up a W2 sales job. And man, that helped me sleep so much better at night. Mm. So we added on leasing, uh, just like what Sterling said with the network. Like we got so many leads uh, with leasing and that definitely like kept my nose above water and helped me to breathe uh, in addition to the W-2. And then I got licensed in December. So now we got retail sales. So we got sales coming through on top of that. So right now it's just all about liquidity, building up reserves. And when we do get back into acquisitions mode, like, Man, I'm going to be so crucial on underwriting, it's not even funny. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving forward with 2024, that that's really it. Like just putting together a bulletproof underwriting system, uh, which the experience gave me that. So it's not spreadsheets at all anymore. Like I know exactly what this worst case scenario will feel like and what's going to lead us down that path. Um, so that's it for me. Like it, mm -hmm. I, I kept it simple. So, so that's it. And you said, you, I mean, like I think you described, you said this to me um, at out off, off the microphone, but like multiple streams of income. That's really what you're saying. Hell like yeah. this, this liquidity, what you're saying is you're Non-stop. Multiple streams of income. Yeah, with, so with my philosophy at this point, like, so when I was doing a lot of things in the business at one time, uh, people would say, you need to focus, you need to niche, whatever. I'm not listening <laughs> to that no more. So, so, so some, of that, some of that I do agree with. So I would say, I would say diversify in your niche, put it to you like that. So, like that's in your will, property management, construction, that's in your wheelhouse. Like I'm not gonna do property management, construction and have bounce houses and sell cars and stuff like that. So for me, if it's in the vertical of real estate, I could get it done from a cell phone to laptop and I could leverage my network, I'm doing it. Mm. So leasing, wholesale, realtor, uh, whatever I have the resources to do and I could actually deliver a service, I'm doing it. I'm not taking anything off of the table that's in my capacity, right? Mm. So absolutely. So when you talk about multiple streams of income, including rental portfolios and assets that can be sold, all of that is included to prepare for doomsday because with nature of real estate, it will happen and we have no control over it. Yeah. Like property taxes quadrupling, no control over it. Hurricane, we dodged the bullet this year. We don't know what 2024 is gonna hold, no control over it. So. Uh, I think cash is is the best hedge, and multiple streams of feeding that cash into uh, into your business. Go for it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Awesome, man. And I th I think that's really interesting. And I might it might sort of sum up tonight, right? There's like been lots of people speak in different perspectives, and I think it's really interesting, right? Because multiple streams of income, you say people will say to focus, right? Both of those things are true, mm -hmm. right? Like like both of those pieces of advice are right. Like focusing is a good thing, right? But diversifying is a good thing too, right? Mm. So there is no right or wrong, right? You've heard lots of different people to do different things tonight. They're all successful in their own right. Like, and, and it's not about what's right or wrong. It's about, you know, listening to the different perspectives and then figuring out for yourself what your perspective is going to be, right? So, you know, we hope, we hope tonight was good and it's a different, bit of a different format. You know, I'm hoping that like it gives you guys some perspective on how different people are thinking. I'm hoping it gets you thinking about what you want to do and yeah.
Absolutely, absolutely. I remember so so Sterling so Sterling's guys. If you haven't watched Sterling's video, go to our YouTube channel. It's awesome, right? But I remember, dude. People came, people listen to Sterling like, holy shit. Like like that dude. I've like no one's moved as fast as him, right? It's fast, right? But then that's right and it's good and it helped you because you were able to sell things, but you also had to slow down, right? Like so nothing nothing's right or wrong. Everyone's at different spaces. Listen to it, figure it out, but get your own learning lessons from this year. Get your own plan for next year. Get your own focus. Figure it out. The one thing I heard consistently from all the speakers, right? There was a lot of people talking about. I heard kicked in the teeth and the tampons in nose and all sorts of <laughs> stuff, right? But, but, tell you what I didn't hear. Not one person said they were stopping real estate. Mm. Not one person said they weren't buying deals. No one's stopping, right? Like, there, there's lessons you take them. That makes you smarter. You keep moving. You do better, right? We'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. We're not, we're not going to do Q and A's in this one. Uh, we're sort of a fart. We're trying to like fit like seven people in, right? Eight people in. So, so uh, we're not going to do Q and A, but I think the majority of the speakers are going to be at drinks at Catuso. So we always, we normally do these on the second Thursday of the month. Um, we're doing this on the first Thursday just because it's December, right? Um, but we normally do it the second Thursday of the month. Uh, we go to Gattuso's afterwards. We have drinks and food. It's free. Just pick up your own tab. Uh, Thursday, second Thursday. You said Thursday. Did I say Tuesday? I thought so. Definitely Thursday. Okay. It's, de right. <laughs> it's definitely Thursday. So second, second Thursday. Thank yeah. you. Um, so um, go over there afterwards. Um, have a drink. Any, anything you want to add, Amir? Anything you want to? Any? I, I just want to say. Uh, say what? Ne next tu next Tuesday night. Um, uh, Courtney has the North Shore Ria. It's a really good Ria, which is on a Tuesday, the second Tuesday, first uh, of the month. Uh, you got a potluck this month. I'm paying cash flow. Awesome. Mike, do you want to talk about St. Bernard? We got, I think we've got a minute. Sterling, you had the red, you had, the, you had, the, you had, the, you had the red, a red bank last night. But do you want to talk about that? Let's see. Cool. Uh, thanks again to our speakers. Um, all, all I want to add yeah, to yeah. that. So first, first of all, I want to say thank you to the to the group. So from January all the way until now, like I know I've gotten 50x return just as far as collaboration and just uh, I don't know nowhere else where you could have got the information that you got today with people being vulnerable, people being honest. You're not going to get it from YouTube because on YouTube, everybody's making money and nobody's taking losses. <laughs> So, and this is a room <laughs> where, <laughs> yeah, for real. So, and this is a room where you could come and really hear like what, what this business is uh, really like um, on a consistent basis. So I just want to say thank you for everybody coming in and sharing that story and not biting your tongue uh, because I think that's what make people go much further in this business when they hear these real stories like that. I know it is for me from listening to people's losses and their wins at the same time. Uh, so thank you all. So if any round of applause, I would say, uh, for this group, like Investor Fest was a success twice uh, this year. So thank you all for coming out for that. And we just want 10 exit uh, next year. So if we had 150 this year, like how can we get to 1,500? That's our challenge for everybody. Same thing here. If we got 40 here, how can we get 400 in the room uh, every month on a consistent basis? So that's my challenge to the group. Awesome. All right. So, so, so thanks to all the speakers and thanks to all of you all for coming and, and yep. tuning in. Yeah.